please know that whatever um, I share with you, that I, I do this in my own home. I have a, a daughter who's going to be 11, as she reminds me, in exactly seven days. And that even though we are sort of in quarantine, she still, you know, is going to celebrate that birthday. Um, and also a 15-year-old son who happens to be part of the Amaze Ambassador Program, too. So if I share anything about them, I promise I've gotten their consent in advance. I've already asked <laughs> them. Um, and there's nothing that I'm going to share with any of you that I don't do in my own home as well. So with that, um, Lincoln, if you don't mind. Ah, okay. So I'm going to just walk you through um, tips for how to incorporate more of these conversations about sex and sexuality at home at a time where we have, well, endless amount of time and opportunity. So I have to be honest, it was super hard to whittle down um, a very long career thus far in sex ed into five uh, tips. So you're going to get six of them because I just couldn't help myself and I could not commit to five. But uh, we'll start here. So I would think that one of the biggest, um, I think one of the biggest challenges we have when we talk about sex or sexuality or want to is that we actually don't think about what we really want to tell the young people in our life before were forced to answer some kind of question. And I don't know about any of you, but sometimes what happens, our kid will ask us a question and we will get a little bit nervous about it. And all of a sudden we will do this verbal bleh, unload of all of these things. We'll tell, share too much. We'll share things they don't want to hear about. They'll walk away from the conversation. And all of a sudden we'll think to ourselves, <laughs> That is absolutely not what I wanted to say. <laughs> that isn't even close. Those aren't even my values. I don't know what that was. I'm parroting my parent, but I, I, I didn't even think about it. So the first thing is before we have any kind of conversations, it's really important to think about what it is you want to, what values you want to impart to your kids. What information do you want to tell them? Otherwise, you find yourself backpedaling. And again, that's fine, right? We make mistakes. We need to own up to it. And sometimes it's really valuable to tell our kids. And by kids, I mean, if we are a parent, caregiver, guardian, they don't have to be our own biological kids. But um, to say, you know what, you asked me a question. I didn't really think through the answer I wanted to give you. So here's what I really want to say. All right, next tip. Maybe. <laughs> okay. So I often find that, um, especially having kids in adolescence now, I'm remembering all of these things that I had absolutely forgotten about my own youth, whether it's interactions I had with other people, experiences I had, experiences I wanted to have, but maybe did not. Um, and it occurs to me that there's so much that young people can learn from us and that we can learn from them. So I think it's important to, to commit in this time to sharing something every week about how we grew up, how our lives might be similar or different, um, what development looked like for us. When I teach in classrooms, I often tell kids I'm going to give them homework. And it's not going to be the kind of homework that's graded per se, but it's the conversation starter homework. You know, I want young people to go home and discuss with a parent or caregiver, what was it like to have a first crush? You know, how was that how was it shopping for deodorant? And, and even the shopping for deodorant um, conversation, as benign as it may sound, I mean, I remember having maybe three deodorant options as a young person. And now when you go through the aisle, I mean, you can smell like coconut macaroon. I didn't have that, you know? So um, yes, I'm envious. I'm envious of the options that young people have today. But I think it makes us seem human. I think it makes us talk about our similarities as well as our differences and certainly respect them all. And then of course, you know, if we leave room for other conversations and questions, it opens the door for so many future interactions with our young people. Okay, next slide. Ah, one of the things I think that we have done incredibly well is that we have so many conversations about consent, about what it means to give and get permission and have it be enthusiastic and, and um, freely given and ongoing and mutual. 
But the interesting thing is that I think we sometimes do ourselves a disservice when we make consent solely about bodies and how we share our bodies with someone else. And consent isn't simply about sexual behaviors, though obviously, I mean, that is essential and critical for, for sexual health and development, but it's also about how we as parents and caregivers interact with our young people using technology. So truth be told, when I try to have this conversation about consent and technology with my students, and these are students of all ages, I ask them, do you get permission before you post a photo of someone on your social media accounts? And I have to say, they don't always say yes, but they always talk about how they know they're supposed to do that. So sure, we have a lot more work to do. But one of the things they absolutely say is, well, hey, Logan, um, my parents never get my permission before they post something of me. So it becomes really difficult to teach our kids how to interact with the world with respect to consent if we don't model those skills and that kind of respect for them in our own home. And look, it's not just about technology, it's about simply respecting someone's privacy or personal space. If a door is closed, knock on it. Um, and I would say that I, that I will do that for my young people and I would hope that they would do that for me as well. So it's important to broaden our definitions of consent because the likelihood is that we have been practicing the skills and models and scripts for consent for a long time, and maybe it wasn't explicitly about sex. All right, tip four. <laughs> so I think that sometimes we want to make these conversations even if we don't want them to be heavy handed, sometimes they don't come out that way. And if you are a sex educator, as I know many of you on this, um, on this call are, um, we, we utilize anonymous question boxes all the time. We wanna create spaces for people to know that they can ask whatever question that they wanna ask, free from guilt and shame. So let us apply those same techniques at home. Um, I always like using a fishbowl, but it could be a bowl, it could be an actual fishbowl, it, it could be a tissue box. But some place where we get to submit questions, and they might not ju be just about sex or sexuality or puberty, it could be about friendships, it could be about just some understanding of who, who we are and the things we like to do. But use the anonymous question box to our advantage and we can make a game out of it so we can have these conversations and learn new things about each other. All right, tip five. <laughs> Representation matters. And I feel like I could stop it right there, but I'll, I'll expand just a bit. Um, I spend a lot of time talking about this really holistic view of sexual health. When I was growing up in the time of um, when, when HIV and AIDS was finally being publicly discussed as a virus that didn't discriminate. Um, you know, at, at that time, we, my goodness, I forgot my train of thought for a second, but we weren't exposed to a lot of diversity. And sexual health isn't simply about what we do to take care of our own bodies. It is equally as much about the messages we get from pop culture and politics and the quality of our relationships and the access we have to information and services and all of these things play a role. But what's equally as important is our emotional sexual health. And it is really hard to be emotionally sexually healthy if you don't see yourself represented in your world, in the media you consume, in the things your family is consuming or the things that your, your friends and peers are exposed to. So this is a wake up call for us as parents or caregivers to be a little bit more thoughtful and a little bit more attuned to what our kids are exposed to. And I don't just mean about sexually explicit media. I mean, are they seeing diversity of gender and gender expression, race, sexual orientation, ethnicity, ability and disability, body shape and type? And if they are not seeing those things, then we need to do a better job at bringing all types of, of diversity into the media that they consume. We can watch them together, we can have conversations, we can have conversations about why people are not represented in media. 
Critical thinking skills are so important and seeing yourself represented is a huge part of becoming a sexually healthy person. Okay, bonus tip time because again, I couldn't commit to five. <laughs> Perhaps one of my favorite um, tips or, or sayings when I'm talking to my, um, my parent groups is inevitably I will have someone say to me, Logan, I want to do all of these things, but they just don't want to talk to me. They'll roll their eyes, they'll earmuff, whatever it is. And my comment is always this, mm, that's too bad for them. <laughs> and I don't mean it as a punishment for young people, but really what I mean to say is that these conversations are truly about us. When we signed up in some way, and I'll use the word sign up in quotation marks, um, to become a parent and caregiver, we made certain promises. We made certain promises to do things differently, to really raise sexually healthy, thoughtful young people. So that's okay, honey. You, I know it. You, you know it all already, and you might not want to hear it from me right now, but it's okay. This actually isn't about you. It's about me. I need to send you off in the world knowing that I have fulfilled all of my promises. And the funny thing is, when you frame it like that, it's really hard for young people <laughs> to respond <laughs> with anything negative because we put the pressure and the onus back on us and not on them. So with that, I think I have done enough talking for right now, but now that we've covered the basics regarding talking about all issues of sex and sexuality, Janae, I would love for you to share your tips and guidance on dealing with mental health strategies in this time of social isolation. Oh, thanks so much, Logan. I was sitting here like, oh, these are great tips. I am going to go back and make sure my parents uh, <laughs> follow you and keep up to date with this amazing org. Um, so yeah, during this time, there's a lot happening in terms of being quarantined and a lot of kids and teenagers are feeling so isolated away from everything and they are just so upset that they are basically home with their families <laughs> um, because they want to be with their friends. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about mental health and how to support your child or your teenager during this quarantine time. And we're going to go ahead and get started. So, all right. So tip number three, I created a whole lot of tips because <laughs> my brain was just moving. So Lincoln, thank you for picking the ones that you felt would be appropriate. Um, so I want you to have a conversation about a new normal. One of the things that I've been talking to a lot of my teens about is life probably isn't going to go back to the way that it was. And it's important to have a conversation about the world that we once knew it is gone. You know, it is a unique opportunity to create new customs in your family and creating new traditions will allow for a more rewarding experience while everyone is at home. So I think it's really a good opportunity to say, okay, hey, let's stop. Let's think about what we normally do. Are there some things we can change? Do we have to always eat this? Can we try to eat something else? Can we try to actually have a movie night or a game night? Our schedules are a little bit different now. Can we do something different? Let like just take some time to evaluate if the way that your family has been connecting works right now. And again, it's a good opportunity to bring your children in and say, hey, what would you like to do differently? Um, what would you like to eat for dinner tonight? What type of games would you like to play? And that helps again to create a more rewarding time with your family <laughs> because you're trying something new together versus everyone trying to acclimate to a schedule that's probably a little chaotic right now especially if you have a bunch of little ones and everybody's trying to be on the computer wi-fi is crashing all day long <laughs> because of school and work and so it's a good opportunity to create some new customs and traditions in your family so have a conversation about a new normal um lincoln next tip thank you oh, fun listen fun doesn't happen enough in my opinion <laughs> and i wish we embrace a little bit more fun so i don't want you to have your schedule to be completely full of getting up at 8 a.m being in school all day just oh it feels kind of like the military so allow some fun to happen and just 
enjoy, let your hair down, turn on some music in the middle of the day and dance with your child, you know, have a party, have them put on a song that they love. You put on a song that you love. They're probably going to comment and not like your song, but that's okay. You're probably not going to like their song either. Cause usually that's just how it goes from generations, you know, TikTok. One of my favorite things, <laughs> I know everybody, right? TikTok, yes. Get on TikTok, have some fun. Just let your hair down. You know, it's just a lot of, a lot of moves, but you know, just go for it. Have a good time. Allow them to have fun time and don't interrupt that fun time. So many times I will hear a parent or a child or a teen say, I was out hanging with my friends and then my parents or they told me that I had to come back and I had to do this chore. Don't interrupt the fun time. If the fun time is going to be for an hour or two hours, let fun time be for an hour or two hours. Trust me, having that boost is going to allow them to get right back into their schedule and pretty much listen to whatever you say because now they feel really happy and excited that they got to have some fun. Uh, all right, Lincoln, next tip. Uh, you did it already. <laughs> or at least my eyes are not working. One, one of the two is happening here. Um, so this is a really important mental health tip because loss is very, very, very visible and present in our world today with the virus and everything that is happening with um, Corona. So in terms of processing and grief and loss, it's really important just to acknowledge that there is a loss, whether it's a loss of time spent with friends, whether it's a loss of, you know, I feel so bad for eighth graders and high schoolers who may not get to have their actual graduation, a loss of trips and just family activities, so many different things. Some kids actually like school, believe it or not. And so they may feel that they're not connected with their academics and they're missing out on things. And so it's really important just to allow sadness to happen. There are some, your teen may, your teen or your child may need a mental health day. They may need a day just to kind of lay around, be in their bed, sleep, and maybe they just want to talk to their friends and they just want to grieve the loss of not being able to be with their friends and connect. And so, you know, allowing that to happen and not, you know, being too forceful or um, as some people will call it, like toxic positivity, um, always just so optimistic as if things don't suck. If they think it sucks, let them think that it sucks. They may not think it sucks forever, but it's okay for them to let, you know, feel that it sucks in that moment. Um, and just understand that mood shifts are expected during this time and they really just need some embracing. And a bonus there is to acknowledge the loss that you are experiencing as a parent. Because I think a lot of parents tend to, you know, want to keep themselves elevated and act like they have it all together. And it's just such a trying time. I think it's really important to even acknowledge to your child that you are experiencing some loss as well. You probably miss some of your coworkers that are obnoxious at the coffee machine or something, who knows? But it's okay just to acknowledge that you miss them and that you are also experiencing some loss during this time. Oh, next tip. All right, state facts about the pandemic. So <clears throat> what I have found to be really interesting, as I'm sure most of you have, there's a lot of reporting around the virus, around what's happening, around what we should do, around what we shouldn't do. And I think the best thing we can do is just to pick one trusted source to provide information to your family and only check it once a day, just so that you can keep yourself grounded, you can keep your children grounded, and you're not bombarding yourself or your children with all of this information. Um, most parents, all of that information you're receiving, you're probably giving it back to your child. And even if you're not verbally saying something, if you are subconsciously anxious or consciously anxious because you're reading a bunch of information, your interactions with your children may also reflect that. And they may not know what's wrong, but you are frustrated, you're anxious, you're worried. And then that, again, translates to them. And it's important to be very mindful of that. And the best way to do that is to not consume as much information and pick a source that you feel confident when you read it. So, you know, there are a lot of different news sources out there, but I'm sure you all read some news sources and you get, you know, knots in your stomach because you're like, why are they reporting like this? What is this? I, what? What? Oh, no. You know, and Twitter fingers and all kinds of stuff and you're on Facebook and all that. So 
if that's the kind of news source you're looking at, that's probably not a good one because it's creating a bodily reaction of anxiety. So you want to pick a news source that you feel that you trust the facts, you trust what they're sharing, and again, you just want to check that once a day. And the facts are really going to be essential for you and your youth so that they have a sense of understanding of what's actually happening and so that can ground them during these uncertain times. All right. Okay, well, there you have it. Those are a few of my tips for um, quarantine mental health, if you will. I feel like that should be a new term, quarantined mental health. I'm, I'm sure it will be. Jenny, that, was, that was amazing. And I, I keep thinking that um, there's a lot of work that I have to do. Um, I will say we do, we do have very intense Scrabble tournaments. We have, we have definitely set that up like family competition time. Um, but I, I, I do make them get up for school. So maybe, um, maybe I should like hold back a little bit. So thank you for that. You, you've given me the, <laughs> the rationale that I need. <laughs> Awesome. You know, every once in a while you need a mental health day or even taking a break in the day. So if you and all, you know, your family, they're getting up early for school or work, maybe just eating lunch together, deciding, okay, I'm going to have lunch with my child. I'm going to take a break from work and have lunch and just act like it's the cafeteria, you know, say, hey, let's tell me all the gossip, <laughs> you know, what's going on on Snapchat, what's going on on TikTok. And <laughs> Um, keep you all the way updated with the teen and the children juice. <laughs>